So I've spent some time in the past couple of videos going over the portfolio changes for investors like Guy Spear and Monish Parai, mainly concerning their decision to buy or in Monish Parai's case, add more to their positions in Alibaba. I know the 13 Fs were reported a couple of weeks ago at this point, but I haven't had a real chance to dig into a bunch of the other investors that I really like to look at. So in this video, I'm going to cover the portfolio changes for some of my other favorite managers, including Pat Dorsey, David Tepper, Bill Miller, and Lee Lu. I think most of these investors have pretty similar investment approaches, and that would be making pretty concentrated bets within their portfolio. However, the results of this quarter actually vary pretty greatly from investor to investor that I'm going to cover. And I promise this video is not gonna just be about Alibaba. So if you're tired of hearing about Alibaba, then please continue to watch. Please let me know in the comments below if you follow any of these super investors that I'm going to talk about in this video. And also let me know if any of these positions are intriguing to you and if there's something you want me to do a deep dive into in the future. So let's go over some of the portfolio changes for some of the super investors that I'm following for the second quarter of the fiscal year 2021. Okay, Pat Dorsey is one of these investors that I have not been following for a long time. I think about two quarters ago, I had somebody comment on my channel that suggested that I might like Pat Dorsey and boy, do I. In fact, I just picked up his book, The Little Book That Builds Wealth, and I've read a few pages of it, but I'm really looking forward to completing the entire book and I'll probably do a video trying to summarize the core concepts from this book. But basically Dorsey's main thesis is he wants to find companies with great moats that he can find at reasonable prices that he wants to hold for a long time. I don't know if this sounds familiar to you, but it sure as hell sounds like something that comes straight from the mouth of Warren Buffett. And Really, there is no better investor to emulate than Warren Buffett. So I'm all for a new, relatively young investor who is looking to find a company with defensible moats that they want to hold for basically forever in, or until the price exceeds greatly the intrinsic value. All right, enough about Dorsey. I'll probably cover his philosophy in greater depth in another video. Let's hop into the actual portfolio changes. According to Dataroma, Dorsey manages about $1.3 billion. So his fund is not massive, but it is still pretty large. But the thing I like about Dorsey, just taking a glance at his portfolio, is number one, the amount of positions in his portfolio. He has nine positions, which is very concentrated. And then among those, he's definitely more concentrated in some more than others. For instance, Facebook. He has almost 18% of his portfolio here in Facebook. And that is with, in this quarter, he sold off almost 10% of the shares that he held in Facebook. And as we'll see, Dorsey has added a lot to some other companies in his portfolio. So this sale of Facebook, his number one conviction bet based on portfolio percentage, doesn't mean that he's losing faith in the company. Uh, maybe he deems Facebook as getting somewhat close to the intrinsic value for the company and wants to just take a little bit off the table and spread that to some of his other bets where he thinks he's going to maybe have a little bit more opportunity to grow that money. This next company, Smartsheet, is one of the companies that I definitely want to dive into deeper because it almost is as high of a conviction. I mean, in all for all intents and purposes, it is as high of a conviction bet as Facebook. And in this quarter, he added almost 18% to his position in Smartsheet. So this makes up about 18% of his portfolio as well. And it's interesting to note that now he owns about 2.5% of this company. Uh, I think the market cap is just under $10 billion at the time of recording this video. Smartsheet is basically a cloud platform for managing documents and workflows and calendars and things of that nature for businesses. And part of the reason why I'm so intrigued by this company is their financial state. So they appear to be in very high growth mode and maybe I'll cover this in a different video, but they're actually losing a lot of money. So it seems like it's gonna be an interesting company to study from the vantage point of these companies with high defensible moats. And if Smartsheet has one, even though it's losing money, uh, that's not a situation I'm super familiar with. I'm usually looking at companies that are actually making money. So I'm gonna dive into that one too. And this is a trend with Dorsey, which I love, is that he's really into asset light companies. So Wix.com is about 14% of his portfolio and he owns about 1% of that company. Uh, he added almost 50% to his position in Wix this quarter. 
So Wix offers pretty much no code solutions to building your own websites. So this is a software company. Um, the code is obviously very cheap. There's just the cost of the servers and the cost of the developers. Subscription-based, asset light, high recurring revenue type of business. So Wix, again, very much intriguing to me if it makes up almost 15% of Dorsey's portfolio. I'm definitely loving seeing that. And then we have some familiar faces that at least to my eyes at a first glance, might be overvalued in eBay and PayPal. Uh, he added the same amount, about 18% to each of these companies, and they each make up 12% of his portfolio. So this is a trend where you can clearly see he's very concentrated in a select few companies, but all of which are very asset light. He also added almost 18% to his position in Upwork. He had a couple notable sales, including his Google position, which now only makes up less than 5% of his portfolio after selling almost 24%. And then he sold his Despergar shares, uh, making up about 3.3% of his portfolio. He didn't make any changes to Walt Disney Company this quarter. Dorsey obviously added a lot to some of these other positions in his portfolio, and that money really has to come from somewhere. So what I would take away from this, he sold almost a quarter or almost a third of Google and Despregar.com. Uh, perhaps he is reaching full intrinsic value for this Google position. I don't know much about Despregar at all. And maybe he made a mistake. Maybe he is just taking some money off the table there as well. It looks like he bought Despregar back in 2019 at some point and the stock really hasn't moved at all. So maybe he is actually realizing that his initial thesis or his initial assessment of the moat of this company was actually incorrect. So he sold off a third of the company. Um, that's just a speculation, but based, based on his concentration as other positions, uh, that seems to be the read for me. All right, next up, let's move on to Appaloosa Management, which is managed by David Tepper. Now, probably the first thing you'll notice when looking at this portfolio is the huge amount of red here in the percent changes in number of shares held column. To quickly point out, uh, I'd like to follow David Tepper because of his concentrated positions. Let's see, he has almost 10% in Micron, 9% in Amazon, 9% in Facebook, 8% in Alphabet, 8% in T-Mobile, and so on. Tepper also holds some value investing darlings such as Alibaba. He also has shares in companies such as Uber, Twitter, and Microsoft. So he's clearly not afraid of technology, which is wonderful to see from a value investor. But back to the main point of David Tepper's portfolio changes is I wanna look at all of the sales that he's made. He only added to two positions actually this quarter, Mosaic and Freeport McMorrin, which I don't know anything about those companies, and they're pretty small bets. So I'm probably not gonna cover them too in depth. The Micron is another one of those companies that's heavily followed and invested in among the value investing community. We've got titans such as Monish Pavai and Li Lu invested in Micron. This is speculation, but perhaps Tepper is seeing Micron hit a cyclical peak and is deciding to maybe play it safe. Another possibility is that because it's such a widespread sale across his whole portfolio, Perhaps he is anticipating some sort of market downturn, which is very possible. A lot of these companies that he sold, I'm sure he's made quite a bit of money on, especially his larger positions in Micron and Amazon. But then we can go quickly down the list. 33% from Amazon, 34% sale of Facebook, 37% Alphabet, 40% T-Mobile. And this is another big one. He's sold almost 50% of his Alibaba shares. And to be honest, that doesn't surprise me too much. Uh, the previous quarter, he actually sold about 40% or so percent of his Alibaba holdings. So it looks like he is dwindling down his position there. I'd love to pick his brain to see whether he's shaken by the regulations or the uncertainty surrounding the government, or if he just doesn't think that the business is going to be dominant as it has been in the past. Then we can jump down to some of these more familiar names. He, ha he does have some shares in energy companies as well up here in his high conviction bets, but in some of his smaller companies, such as Uber, Twitter, and Microsoft, and by small, I mean by uh, percentage of his portfolio. These companies are by no means small. Uh, Twitter, he sold 50%, and Microsoft, he sold 32%. So I think it's more of an across the board type of situation where he wants to take money off the table. Perhaps he thinks that it's best to prepare for a downturn instead of being fully invested at a time like this. So I find his portfolio really interesting because we don't see a lot of sales across the board like that. Okay, next up we have Bill Miller. Now his portfolio isn't as concentrated as I would typically like, 
but I think the guy is just really smart and I like paying attention to him. So this is for his Miller value partners, but it looks like some of the highest conviction bets is DXC technology where he sold off about 13% and that makes almost 5% of his portfolio. So his largest position is 5%, which, you know, I'm leaning more towards the Pat Dorsey situation where, you know, 18% of your portfolio is in one position. There was a slight add to the Amazon position, which makes up a little less than 4% of the portfolio. He added about 2.6%. But recently in a Barron's interview, which I covered in another video that I'll link up here, Miller talked about how he thinks that Amazon is a pretty easy double. So he's willing to put almost 4% of this fund's portfolio into Amazon. So with that said, it is kind of nice to see this next position on his list, which makes up about 3.3% of the portfolio, which is Alibaba. Now in contrast to David Tepper, who basically sold half of his shares in Alibaba this quarter, Bill Miller almost added 50% to his shares in Alibaba. Perhaps I'm reading too much into this, but it looks like Amazon and Alibaba share very similar percentages of this portfolio. Perhaps that means that the potential upside for both of these companies looks very similar in his mind. Businesses do have some things in common, but one is a dominant giant in the United States and another is being hit by a lot of regulatory and government legal changes. In that Barron's article, he actually also mentioned General Motors. He said, I think that there was at least a 50% upside for GM and he's given that about 2.5% of his portfolio with a 3% addition. There are also a bunch of familiar names such as Facebook and Alphabet, but he's not really making too many changes. One company to watch out for is Splunk. Now it's a terribly disgusting company name, but Miller has added 470% to this position. That's just massive. It looks like Splunk provides software for machine log analysis. Then that's not something I'm too familiar with, but it looks like they are transitioning their business to more of a recurring revenue software as a service business. So perhaps this is a, a hidden sort of company that not a lot of people know about and don't understand the future trajectory of this business. So I definitely think I wanna take a look at this business, even though I really hate the name. Again, last but certainly not least, I wanna cover Lee Lu's portfolio. Now, looking at his portfolio here, it doesn't look like a whole lot has happened. And I like to cover portfolios like this every quarter because it really reinforces some of the key factors that I'm trying to do when I'm investing my money. Mainly, I'm trying not to do anything quarter to quarter. Now that doesn't always happen, but this is the type of action that I like to see. Guy Spear does this a lot. Monish Prabhai does this a lot. Li Lu is the recent master of doing nothing. We see no changes in any of his US held companies. And recently in a trade report, there was a 15% sale of his stake in BYD. He's a pretty large shareholder. He owns 6% of that company based on this trade report. A lot of people ask about whether or not Li Lu holds a position in Alibaba. And frankly, I don't know the answer to that. I really wish I did know the answer to that. I would imagine that if he does, it's probably on the Hong Kong exchange where he is not required to report that with the SEC. We do see these BYD shares that are listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, but he is such a large shareholder that perhaps it's easier to find that type of information because he probably has to report for owning such a large percentage of the company. Regardless, Lilu owned Baba several quarters back and sold out. Uh, he actually bought the New York Stock Exchange listed company and he owns Pinduoduo, which is listed on the, the NASDAQ. So again, pure speculation on whether or not he actually owns Alibaba. Perhaps he's bought it in this recent price drop, um, or maybe he's just completely staying away from it. It would probably send a comforting signal to a lot of investors out there who are slowly watching their Alibaba shares go down in value. However, we need to remember the intrinsic value of a company is not always reflected by Mr. Market's assessment of the company. So the lessons from Li Lu are, make high concentration bets in wonderful businesses, and two, sit on your hands and let the businesses grow. As I hope is clear based on these portfolios of super investors that I covered in this video, there is really no one way to make investment decisions here. I mean, in one quarter, we had one investor selling huge stakes in all of his top positions, and some not doing anything at all, and some adding pretty heavily. For me, this hammers home the idea that Value is in the eye of the beholder. 
where some people might see a really overheated, overpriced market. Others are seeing a lot of great opportunity. So it's all about the way that we are viewing and analyzing the companies. And I wanna reiterate that I love following all of these investors because I think that they are more on the side of holding wonderful businesses for a long time, especially in the case of Pat Dorsey and Lee Lu. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about other super investor portfolio changes for this quarter, then I would suggest you check out this video over here where I discuss Monish Prabhai's recent changes to his portfolio, where he added a ton to his stake in Alibaba. Otherwise, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching this all the way to the end. I really appreciate your time and I will see you in the next video.